So I'll start sharing my screen. And I just, all right. Can anybody give me a thumbs up or just let me know if you can see? Great, Laurel, thank you. And I'm going to just minimize all of you so that you're not on the recording, great. All right, welcome everyone to Intermittent Fasting presentation. And uh, so let's just start. And so I'm just going to have a few um, housekeeping uh, things, kind of uh, go over some housekeeping things before we start. So it is, it is a Zoom session. So during the presentation, just stay on mute. Camera is completely optional. If you have any questions regarding uh, whatever I'm sharing during the presentation, I would request you to write them in the chat box or save them, note them somewhere after the presentation. And I would highly recommend that uh, this is a platform where we do not, it's, it's a more general discussion that I want to have about intermittent fasting. If there are any specific personal questions related to your health concern, uh, this is not the platform for that. I would highly recommend that reach out for uh, reach out in person regarding that. And uh, I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. And also something important that the information that I share today does not replace the advice of a medical practitioner. Please check with your doctors, your medical practitioners before introducing any kind of protocol suggested today, especially if you have a health condition or if you're a diagnosed health condition and if you're taking any medications and anything I discussed today is not any kind of medical advice. And I'll get to the questions in the end. Um, so what is the agenda today? I'm going to break down intermittent fasting. We're going to define it. And uh, and we kind of, we can have a brainstorming session after that in case if you feel uh, that there is more to it. I'm going to talk about the benefits and the proper way of intermittent fasting. And also I'm going to share who it is not for. Uh, there is a certain kind of people, category of people who should not be fasting, and we will get go over that as well in the end and the questions, as I said. So before I begin, there are a few uh, terms which I would like to make very, very clear before I continue. And that's important because this, these terms are required for you to kind of understand the rest of the concepts which will be discussed in the presentation. So the number one term, which uh, hopefully a lot of you are aware is insulin. It is very commonly spoken about, especially in the world of diabetics. But insulin is basically a hormone. All of us have it. It's a hormone which is which is used to carry sugar to the cells, to our whole in our whole body. So every time you eat food, your body produces insulin. It is produced in your stomach, in not in your stomach, in your uh, intestines uh, by the pancreas. And uh, it is uh, it is what is basically the truck which carries the sugar to your cells. And, uh, and what is insulin resistance? So over time, if there are too many insulin spikes, as in because of whatever habits, I'm not going to discuss this in detail. In fact, I had a presentation on blood sugar. Uh, uh, the last webinar was on blood sugar imbalances and managing that. And that's where I had discussed in detail about insulin resistance. So it's basically when your cells do not want to take any more sugar and every time this truck goes to the cell, the cell shuts the door to that truck and says, no, I'm not going to take any more sugar from you. And what happens is then that excess sugar starts circulating in the blood and you get diagnosed with high blood sugar levels. In case it doesn't um, uh, circulate in the blood, the other place where it kind of gets accumulated is your liver. Uh, and that's when fatty liver disease starts. Uh, it could be alcoholic or non-alcoholic fatty liver or your organs around the stomach area and the visceral, we call it visceral fat, they start accumulating or that excess sugar starts getting deposited um, in your fat cells. So typically when you have high tri triglycerides, LDL, high tri LDL cholesterol levels, you're considered to be a pre-diabetic or when you have fatty liver most of them, I would say 90% of those reasons and even conditions like PCOS and uh, severe migraines before your periods, PMS issues, all have insulin resistance at the root of those conditions. Um, circadian rhythm, a very important concept because that's what we're going to be talking about regarding when it comes to the right way of in doing intermittent fasting. So what is circadian rhythm? It's your bi body's biorhythm which is in sync with day and night. When I say day and night, it's typically the sun and the moon. 
And uh, there are certain chemicals, certain neurotransmitters, certain hormones which are produced during the daytime. And there are certain neurotransmitters which are produced during the night. Like um, as an example, I'll give you serotonin levels are supposed to spike. And serotonin is a neurotransmitter uh, which is produced either in your gut or in the brain. And that is what allows you to carry on with certain functions in the day. And that serotonin gets converted into melatonin at night. So, and melatonin is what allows you to sleep and get into your deep sleep. And so this is what is called the biorhythms. Your body is in sync. And that's why when we spoke about the ancestral man or people or different cultures around the world living in sync with the nature, uh, this was basically now science is seeing that how the body responds to when it's light and bo how body responds to when it's dark. Certain things in the body shut down, certain hormones like growth hormones a function. They, the, there is a spike with growth, hormone, growth hormones at night when you're sleeping. So all that is a part of the circadian rhythm. So the more your lifestyle and your activity is in sync with the circadian rhythm, the faster you will get the benefit of intermittent fasting. And not only that, the better health you will have if you're in sync with this. And the fourth concept, which I would like to uh, introduce today is gut microbiome. Uh, hopefully all of you know about this. It's become really, really big. It's the colony of microbes in your digestive tract. It's, uh, and uh, it's not only just the digestive tract. We are actually surrounded by microbes, the single cell organisms. I call them the sentient beings. They're on you, they're around you, and they're within you. So the gut microbiome is huge because our immune system is trained or primed by the gut microbiome. So the more strains or the more uh, diversity you have of your gut microbiome, the better your immune system functions. Okay, so what is intermittent fasting? So coming down to the definition, it is not a diet. It, it does not require you to restrict as in follow a certain kind of diet. It is a pattern of eating. It's not dieting. It's a pattern of eating within a certain time period, which means it's also it can also be called time-restricted eating. And it's not about starving. So that's why I say it's not about dieting. It's not a diet like you have paleo diets and you have vegan diets or you have a ketogenic diets. It's none of that. Intermittent fasting is basically a pattern of eating. And that's why the word intermittent, that you're taking durations when you're not eating and that there is a duration when you're eating. So uh, hopefully, Michael, we'll talk about this later. This is what intermittent fasting is. So there's nothing new about it, as I shared earlier. The hunter-gatherers or the Paleolithic man has always fasted for long durations. And the way it was is that they used to fast, uh, they used to hunt, they used to find the food, they used to eat, really stuff themselves well, and then for days they could go without eating. And that is what exactly what intermittent fasting also does. What happens is when you eat well and your body has the ability to keep that food going, because when you eat it deposits, it uses whatever it needs right away and the rest is deposited. And then over time, that is used. Uh, and these the Paleolithic man was able to function very well with this kind of a diet and this kind of way of eating was because the amount of labor, physical labor that was involved with the Paleolithic man was a lot more as compared to what we are used to in our current lifetimes. Um, with our current lifestyle, we are basically, most of us have desk jobs. There are very few people who are really doing physical, intense physical jobs. There are a few, I mean, the labor industry, labor intensive industry is still doing that. But definitely, especially in this part of the world, it's a lot more mechanized. It's a lot more automated, lots more. We have a lot more benefits of uh, the white goods and the vacuum cleaners and the dishwashers and um moppers and we have the robots to mop our floors also and all that has made a huge difference in the physical activity level uh, that most of us lead a very sedentary lifestyle now. Something else to also note is that the ancient cultures ate only during daylight hours which is again I was talking about the circadian rhythm. Uh, we as modern uh, beings and as in, in our current lifetimes, current lifetimes have changed that because of whatever reason, I'm not here to judge that reason, but we do not follow that. We are eating well into late into the night. So there are certain ways that we can uh, modify that. 
and yet be a part of the current requirements of we, how life needs us to live today that can be modified for us to get some benefit. So we'll talk about that. And uh, fasting has been a part of many older cultures. We all know, especially in India, we fast regularly. All cultures around the world have some form of fasting as a part of their uh, tradition. And also another concept which I would like to introduce to you is hormesis. So a human body has an inbuilt capacity. Under stress, it learns how to adapt and build resilience. And that term is called hermesis. Now, the way hermesis works is you have to slowly do it over time. You can't just give a shock to the body and expect it. So with slow changes, the body learns and uh, builds the hermesis or the resilience. So how does intermittent fasting work? So it's very important to understand that it works very differently for men and women. And uh, men can get the benefit of intermittent fasting. In general, what we have seen is they can get the benefit of intermittent fasting much, much faster as compared to women. Women are more complicated and that's why it's a little bit, intermittent fasting is a little bit more complicated for women. Uh, so you have a fed state and you have a fasted state. Uh, typically, now I, we are talking about generalizations here, so I'm not going to talk about keto diets and ketogenic at this point of time, but... Uh, the body with intermittent fasting does go into a ketogenic state, which I will talk about um, in some other slides. But typically what happens is when you're in a fed state, sugar is the fuel and whatever you eat, the body converts it into sugar and the insulin carries it to the cells and any excess is stored as, uh, as, is stored as fat. Typically the first place where it's stored is liver and then it's spread based on wherever you have the capacity and your fat cells have a capacity, they can grow fat, uh, big as much as you keep accumulating. And the fasted state typically begins eight hours after your last calorie intake. So if you've eaten a meal at, uh, let's say 12 noon, then typically at eight o'clock in the evening is when you really get into a fasted state because the next eight hours you still have enough fuel, enough sugar with that meal, assuming it's a good balanced meal that you've eaten, your body still has enough calories and enough sugar for it to last and not get switched into a fasted state. So what happens? How does uh, intermittent fasting then kicks in? Typically eight hours, your body starts switching into a fasted state. If you do not eat for 12 plus hours, the body starts using stored glucose as fat. That's when I said you have some uh, glucose deposits which are stored in the liver. They start getting used or it can even start accessing if there's not much in the liver, then they uh, the body starts using uh, fat, which is also stored. Typically after, and these are averages, please don't follow them to the T. Each person is different. As I said, you're a unique bio-individual based on a lot of other things uh, which decide what is your uh, fasted state duration. Uh, when your body kicks in into the fasted state. So typically after 16 to 17 hours, autophagy kicks in or autophagy kicks in. And I'm going to talk in detail about autophagy. And typically it peaks at 72 hours. Uh, after 24 hours, the microbiome resets. Remember I, I told you it's the gut, the colony of your gut bacteria that resets. And this is when the stem cell formation starts. Uh, so that happens after a 24 hour fast. After 36 hours, if you're in a fasted state, the body starts hunting for glucose. So this is when your body will really get into the deep fat cells. Uh, and this is also when the body actually starts releasing a lot of toxins, which happens after 36 hours. And after 48 hours of fasted state, there are dopamine pathways which get reset and even uh, research has seen that there are no new dopamine receptors which start getting formed in the body. So uh, dopamine, if you do not know, is a neurotransmitter, which is the body uses for pleasure, satisfaction and motivation. So also what we say is when you have dopamine levels, at, uh, when you get the dopamine pathways, which are reset, uh, it can give a huge boost to your motivation levels. And that is when you really uh, generate a kind of... Um, uh, we say that people who are depressed or people who are going through emotional and mental challenges, if with the right kind of 
uh, conditions and with the right kind of support and approach, if they're able to fast for 48 hours, they can actually uh, get their dopamine pathways reset. So it can be really, really big uh, in that category of with that category of people. And 72 hours, remember I had said 72 hours is uh, the maximum you should be doing it. So 72 hours of fasting, uh, there is a massive immune system reset. Your whole body has the capacity to reset its immune system. And there is a, like a really strong new generation of stem cells. Now, this is what research has proven now. And that's why they say the benefits of autophagy actually stop after 72 hours. There is still research which is going on. So we are not 100% sure about what happens. Some people could benefit even after 72 hours and there are fast, there are people who fast for 40 uh, days and even longer without eating. They just go on a 40 day fodder fast. They have to get their body prepared for it. So, but intermittent fasting is not about that. We are trying to see from a science perspective, where are we in terms of research and what we are seeing? In fact, the 72 hours fast is what is also being used now for people who have got long COVID. There are certain practitioners or people who've been got side effects of vaccines or vaccine injured or uh, long COVID injuries. They actually, um, there is a protocol for going on a 72 hours fast with certain nutrients, which can really help the body reset the immune system um, and also repair any damage because of long COVID. So what are the benefits of intermittent fasting? We've seen um, all that happens when you're seeing that kind of benefit uh, definitely the first impact, which is the main reason the biohack, which is being used by people is to lose fat, uh, lose weight. So um, the first thing is you lose visceral fat. Now, visceral fat is the fat around your stomach area. Uh, and that's a tough fat to lose. And then you have the subcutaneous fat, which is under your skin. Uh, the reason why we want to focus on the visceral fat is because typically when you have over a certain amount of visceral fat, is when you start developing metabolic health conditions, which is again, diabetes or cholesterol re uh, related issues or heart conditions and fatty liver. That is typically with visceral fat. And we've seen that if intermittent fasting done correctly with the right kind of nutrients, it prevents muscle loss. So when somebody tells you, oh, you're fasting and you will lose muscle loss, I mean, you lose muscle, it's incorrect. And again, I want to remind you that I said there are a certain category of people who should not be doing intermittent fasting and they it may lead to muscle loss for them. And we will talk about that category. But in general, if you're overall not in that state, in a depleted state, in an undernourished state, you would be okay and you would not have muscle loss with intermittent fasting, especially if you're not going to cross 17, 18 hours. And as I said, 72 hours is something which needs to be structured and you need to know how to go to that level uh, it repairs insulin resistance which is big which is huge because i would say almost six to seven people today out of ten have some level of insulin resistance going on when uh people who have been fasting and are not seeing the benefits or have reached a plateau typically the reason is because they have insulin resistance so you need to kind of work on that hormesis which i spoke about to give your body a little bit of a shock, not too much, but a little bit of a shock and slowly change the pattern of intermittent fasting. And uh, so that can repair the insulin resistance. Uh, it, it's basically different words for saying insulin resistance. It's the, your sugar uptake mechanism, the way the body uses, uptakes the sugar and converts it into energy. A typical sign of insulin resistance is you eat a meal and you start feeling tired or sleepy. That means you have some level of insulin resistance going on or any kind of blood sugar imbalances, especially uh, uh, like spikes and drops of blood sugar imbalances, we call it dysglycemia, all that can get repaired with intermittent fasting, promotes autophagy, which I will speak in detail about. That's why it's highlighted because that's the biggest intelligence of the body, how it corrects itself or heals itself. Reset circadian rhythm, insomnia. If you do it correctly, you can actually even treat insomnia to a great extent improves digestion and gut microbiome uh, again autophagy we will talk about that uh, i'll tell you every organ of the body can uh, get benefit from the minute autophagy kicks in and if we do intermittent uh, if you do intermittent fasting correctly it boosts your immune system obviously it's very closely linked to the gut microbiome again 
because it's the bacteria which the strains of the bacteria which prime the immune system what kind of strains are uh, do you have in your colony of bacteria if they are uh, gram negative or opportunistic bacteria obviously if you have a higher number of those then you will they will be causing inflammation with intermittent fasting what happens is you are able to starve those bacteria and you are able to reset that whole colony and once you starve those bacteria because you've not eaten they start dying and what happens is if you feed yourself the right kind of foods after that that die off happens if you eat the right kind of fermented foods the prebiotics the food for the gut microbiome you give an opportunity for the right kind of bacteria to proliferate that means you are repairing your gut microbiome as well uh, and again immune system boosting the immunity means it reduces inflammation because uh, chronic inflammation is basically an issue with chronic immune system responses uh it promotes focus and brain function when i said dopamine receptors it gives you a lot of clarity it gives you a lot of motivation it gives you a lot of focus when you're doing intermittent fasting on a regular basis so what is autophagy or autophagy the word itself when you break it down is auto plus phagy which means eating self eating which means um i mean you see the picture here it says i'm being eaten alive so basically what it does is the body eats itself but the body is not really eating itself it's just a term which has been coined and i forget the name of the researcher who had coined it and in fact i think he did get a nobel prize for coming up with uh, understanding and researching and discovering the body's mechanism of autophagy so it is a typical cleaning mechanism which is inbuilt in each and every one of us what it does is the damaged cells in the body get consumed and destroyed so these could be cancerous cells these could be bad proteins this could be parasitic debris this could be toxins this could be damaged cells which are not functioning very well all of them get consumed so what happens is when you're not eating when uh, an autophagy kicks in remember after 16 to 17 hours is when autophagy kicks in again that's an average for some people it may kick in faster for some people it may take a little bit longer but eventually if you keep doing intermittent fasting your body will get into the state of stage of autophagy now what happens is uh first the body will start using uh its whatever you've eaten and as you keep getting into the fasted state it will start using the fat deposits for a lot of people who do not have fat deposits uh the body the first thing the body will do is the cell wants to survive that's inbuilt mechanism in the body that the cell wants to survive so in order to increase the efficiency of producing energy which i will talk about what autophagy how it functions the cells will start eating whatever is available to them or they'll start burning the damaged cells basically clean up i mean whatever is broken whatever is not needed the cells will start consuming that burning that as a source of fuel and that's what autophagy is and that's why it says it's a self cleaning mechanism of the body it's inbuilt so we all know every human uh the whole human body is basically made up of cells so when i talk about cells the cell has mitochondria the cell has organelles it's you know there is an exchange of information that is happening but typically when we talk about the cells when we talk about your heart cells when we talk about your arteries those are your cells in the arterial walls when we talk about your lungs your body has lungs which are made up of cells and all these organs the cells which again have the dna have the memory or the intelligence to perform the function of that particular organ so when i'm talking about cells in the lungs uh those cells are responsible for the exchange of gases in the lung so that cell has the intelligence because of the dna transfer the intelligence of knowing what that cell's function is so where am i going from here what am i trying to make you understand from here is so that each organ of the body is made up of a typical cell which has the intelligence of the performance of that function now and just as a something to be aware of the only and each cell produces energy and that's how they perform that function when i say the lungs the cell of the lungs are doing the exchange of gases how are they doing it that each cell has a mitochondria which produces the energy and it performs the function so the fuel is basically uh sugar or fat or whatever you eat the cell uses that converts it into energy to perform that function 
So your red blood, red blood, red blood cells are the only cells which do not uh, produce energy. Every other cell in the body actually produces energy to perform the function they're supposed to. So when you have a heart disease, when you have a cardiovascular condition, when your heart is not performing, or when you have blocked arteries, that means the arteries are damaged. Or when you have cancer in a certain area, that means you have cancer cells. So that function, that bo particular body part is got impacted. That means those cells are not functioning well. That means those cells are damaged. Uh, when you have Alzheimer's, it's obviously got to do with the brain. When you're diabetic, and if you have uh, developed insulin resistance or your pancreas are not producing uh, enough energy or and, uh, pancreas are not producing insulin, it's because the cells of the pancreas are damaged. So when the autophagy kicks in, those particular organs which have those damaged cells, they start cleaning. And that's how you can start reversing or start improving the condition. Um, the, like when you have chronic kidney conditions, kidney disease, if with uh, intermittent fasting done properly, you can start actually getting new stem cells in that kidney area when autophagy kicks in and it'll start repairing that particular organ. And that is what I'm talking about. The body has its own intelligence to repair each and every organ and each and every cell of itself through burning or destroying the damaged cells and generating new cells through through stem cell production. So it can be really, really powerful way of uh, kind of stimulating the body's own ability to heal itself. So you can clean up what are the benefits of autophagy. Actually, they're kind of overlapping the benefits of inter intermittent fasting because it triggers autophagy. And as a result of which you get all these benefits, it cleans up the toxic load. It slows down the aging process because again, aging is nothing but cells which are slowing down, which are getting damaged, which are uh, not functioning at their optimum. So it slows that down. It promotes cell uh, stem cell growth. It boosts immunity and fights infection. Again, the whole immune system and the microbiome resets. It fight, fights chronic inflammation and it fights typically whatever I've said, it's the cells start repairing. That means any organ of your body, any muscular system, any neuro uh, system, cardiovascular system, Every organ of the body basically starts regenerating because of the benefits of autophagy. And it takes time and it depends on where you are on a spectrum of health, but that's where the body's intelligence starts kicking in. So another very important aspect, which I have introduced earlier, and again, I'm going to talk in detail, is that the nature's way of intermittent fasting is the following the circadian rhythm. And this is based on an average now. I'm talking about if typically, because you do not want to be doing a 72 hour fast regularly. You're doing going to do that only in short spells whenever you, when you're prepared for it. But on an average, what you're going to be doing is doing intermittent fasting within a 24 hour period. So your eating window should be as much as possible close to between sunrise to sunset or during the daytime, because that is when your body's, insulin spikes are the most that's what the body wants and that is how you will be in sync with the circadian rhythm of the body so you want to eat during when the sun is out and you want to avoid eating when the sun is not out as in when it's dark it's difficult but try to eat as much as possible close to sunset especially in the winters it becomes more challenging because four o'clock is when the sun sets and you want to eat at six which is okay but do try to do it as much as possible closer to sunset and the biggest meal should be around noon or when the sun is at its peak because that's when your insulin is going to get the maximum benefit the body is going to get the maximum benefit of the insulin spikes and uh, the fasting window is obviously from sunset to sunrise or night night time and that's when the insulin levels are the lowest it's the most inactive and that's when you do not want to get the insulin spikes and that is the time when the repair or the restoration of the body is on. You do not want the body to be focusing on breaking down foods or digesting or getting the insulin spikes. That's the time when you want the growth hormones to be active. That's the time you want the repair and the cleaning up mechanism of uh, the body, the autophagy to kick in at night. So typically what I can tell you is whatever condition you are as a lifestyle, make a 12 hour fast a part of your daily life, like without fail. I mean, over the weekend, once in a while, if you break it, and if 
it that window increases but 12 to 13 hours should be a, become a part of your lifestyle there is no reason why anybody should not be able to follow this um uh, as a as a lifestyle I, this is something which i work with each and every client of mine where i tell them that at least a 12 hour fast and it's not even called a fast it's basically eating in eating the way your body wants you to eat and sync with the circadian rhythm it's not i would not call it a fast um, as in a structured fast so what will be an ideal way of intermittent fasting if you've never tried it then start with a 12 hour fast or if you've taken a long break then at least get into the routine of a 12 hour fast if you're already following that that is when you start increasing the duration go to a four, 14 10 window which is typically 14 hours of fasting and 10 hours of eating window so you eat within that 10 hour uh, window or you can go up to 16 or 17 hours 16 8 is the terminology which is typically used but again these are just averages it's up to you how you want to do it and when you start seeing the benefits maximum you can go up to 72 hours for getting the max the benefit of autophagy but when you're planning to do 72 hours you have to slowly build to it do, just do not give a shock to the body and suddenly do 72 hours i would suggest doing getting your body into a routine of 16 or 17 hours and having at least one big meal or two medium meals and then slowly building it up to from 16 go up to 18 go up to 20 or 24 24 day one day fasts are pretty easy to keep i used to have a habit every two weeks i used to do one day of 24 hours and then increase it to 36 and slowly build it up to a 72 hours fast and i think even depending on where you are on a spectrum of health uh and if you are taking any medications then you need to definitely check with your medical practitioner you can go up to a 72 hours fast if you're overall healthy and in a sense don't have any diagnosed medical conditions and you're not hypoglycemic as in you will not you will not have uh, blood sugar drops anyway if you have if you're hypoglycemic then you have you won't be able to do a 16-8 as well uh, you need to modify your diet to be able to do that and uh, so i would suggest once every three months to six months a 72 hours fast can be really really beneficial in maintaining overall health also when you're eating within that eight hour or ten hour window depending on when you're starting uh, always keep a four hours gap between snacks or a six to eight hours between main meals. When you keep eating at short intervals, what the body does is it spikes insulin. And that's a very wrong way of getting your body used to insulin spikes. You want to eat a proper meal, a balanced meal, which has proteins, carbs, and carbohydrates. And there is a slow release of blood sugar so that you do not feel hungry at least for four hours and ideally for six to eight hours. You can snack in between a little or enjoy a tea or a coffee in between. And that's the ideal way of intermittent fasting that have two proper meals. Uh, when you're fasting, there has to be no calorie intake. Uh, you can have initially if you're kind of trying to get into fasting and it's difficult, um, you can have black coffee, you can have green tea. And the third thing that we recommend is Earl Grey, uh, which is basically uh, black tea with no milk. You can use, you can add a little bit of coconut oil or MCT, medium ch chain triglyceride oil, which is basically extracted from coconut oil or ghee, uh, which is clarified butter to your coffee just to begin with, because it will allow the autophagy to kick in. In fact, all three of them and in, including black coffee and green tea helps the body get into the autophagy state. Water is okay. I even recommend sometimes herbal teas are fine as far as they do not have any sugar in them or no fruit-based herbal teas. Uh, eat a balanced and nourish, nourishing meal with whole foods as much as possible. When I say balanced and nourishing meal, uh, there are certain ways of introducing low-carb diets and all, which are very specific for certain conditions and if you want a quick relief. But overall, as a thumb rule, my advice to everyone is have a balanced meal which is, again, based on seasons. Certain foods are in abundance in certain seasons. You eat those. Fruits are in abundance in the, uh, in the summer weather. In the summer season here, that's when you eat a lot of fruits. Um, in the winter season, typically your diet should compromise, compromise a lot of root vegetables and heavy fat, uh, fat foods because that's what your body needs to cope with the heat. And typically in spring is when you start eating a lot of greens and raw foods and sprouts and things like that. Again, a lot of other things to be considered, your gut health, your digestive ability and everything, your age, uh, what, you, what kind of meals you uh, 
generally eat, your family preferences and things like that. Those are all there. But overall, eat a balanced meal. It is not about excess of anything or it is not about avoiding anything. Stick to the same time for eating during the day in general. Uh, again, this can vary depending on what kind of fast you're doing. But uh, this for, this is more relevant to the fact that try to eat. If you're going to eat your dinner at six o'clock regularly, follow that because your body knows when to spike its insulin and it follows a pattern and gets used to it. And uh, it's never a good idea to do extreme fasts. And it's always a good idea to take a break from fasting. Like if you fasted for five days and for two days, do not fast. When I say do not fast, what I'm talking about is not the 12 hour, which has become 12 hours or 13 hours, which has become a part of your lifestyle. When I may mean fasting is something like 14 hours, 16 hours, 17 hours or 20 hours, that kind of a fast, it's always a good idea after five days, take a break. So people do five and two, which is like five days of normal eating and two days of extreme fasting, like they won't eat over two days or the opposite can also be done, which is five days of fasting of 16, 17 hours and two days of eating regularly over the weekend. So different ways you see what works for you. But I'm going to talk a little bit about women and how to fast with intermittent, uh, with your hormonal cycles, because that is where a lot of women feel stagnation has come in or they have a lot of cravings. And what research is now showing is that if you can follow your cycle, that's the most ideal way. And there is a reason why women, especially in certain stages of your cycle, should not be doing extreme fast or should not be fasting for more than 13 hours, 12 or 13 hours, which anyway is a thumb rule that you're, uh, that's become a part of your lifestyle. So typically, if you are cycling, then the first five days, typically, assuming that your period is for five days, those five days, you're just going to follow the 12 to 13 hours, which is your regular thumb rule of following a basic lifestyle. The minute your period finishes from the sixth day to the 10th day, which is the next five to seven days, is when is the best time for you to fast long durations, which is anything over 17 hours or uh, even 20 hours. Or if you're getting into that mode of fasting for longer hours, that's the time when you do 24 hours or 36 hours or 48 hours. And if you plan to do a 72 hours because you've built that is the best time to do a 72 hours fast, which is just after your period is finished. And you, in those next five to seven days, you'll get the maximum benefit at that time. When you're middle of the cycle, which is ovulation, and keep in mind, this is when you're going to avoid long fasts over 14 hours. And typically ovulation is between three to five days, two to four days, depending on where you are. For women who are perimenopausal or menopausal, you think... A full moon is your ovulation stage. And that's when you can start a 30-day cycle from that day or 28 days. And so what you do is consider that as the day when you're ovulating as full moon and you start for 30 days a cycle where you will avoid for two to four days any uh, fast over 14 hours. You do for 14 hours. And then uh, you will avoid 10 days before your periods or a week before your period. You will avoid fasting over 12 hours and you will... Because that's the stage when your progesterone is high or needs carbs and needs sugars and you're not going to really fast and you're going to give in to your carbs cravings and also you're going to eat within the two hours of waking up. This is very, very important for women when you do not listen to your body, when you're in the last stage before you get your period, that's the time when you're most prone to cravings and getting off your rhythm and getting your hormonal imbalances kick in. And uh, so do not avoid fasting, listen to your cravings, eat within two hours of waking up and do not avoid carbs at this stage. In fact, the thing is, do not give in to high sugar cravings at this time, rather eat whole carbs like sweet potatoes, like lentils, like beans, um, uh, whole grain breads. So this is the best time to enjoy the carbs and do not uh, do extreme fasting or anything over 12 to 13 hours in the last week before your periods. Menopausal women, as I said, look for clues from the symptoms. In case you have a lot of hot flashes and things going on, look for those symptoms. Typically, uh, those are uh, because of estrogen being very low or progesterone being very low. Once you are, can clue, get clues from those symptoms. If you do not have any symptoms and you just want to follow a cycle, then follow the full moon as ovulation and then start a 30-day cycle of 
fasting for a few days and doing extreme fast like for five days when your uh, ovulation just calculate how many days you ovulate and then 10 days of no fasting and then you get into the cycle of uh, 13 days if anybody wants to get this and uh, get this in detail just reach out and I can discuss this in detail if there are any questions which come up I'll be able to tell you how the stages work and what is the most ideal way of fasting like this so um who is fasting not for so kids under 18 should not fast because they're in their growth stages ideally they need balanced meals unless you have somebody and it's very uh, disheartening because i've had two people approach me for 14 year olds who've got, developed autoimmune diabetic conditions and it's very sad because that's not the age where kids should be developing autoimmune conditions but it is and in those cases then we really have to structure how they eat and uh, so there we could be doing some kind of uh, structured intermittent fasting but unless uh, like if they have PCOS or obesity, et cetera, then uh, they can fast, but ensure that nutritional density is maintained, that they eat balanced meals. And uh, so, but otherwise kids under 18 should never be made to fast. Pregnant or breastfeeding women should never fast, especially if you're pregnant, never. Breastfeeding can easily follow the 12 and 13 hours window and then make sure uh, the rest of the day you're eating very well because you're feeding another child another baby I mean feeding another being apart from yourself any frail weak or underweight seniors if you're in a stage where uh, you're really undernourished or you're really in a uh, very weak state you do not have fat you're uh, very bony and very skinny very frail you should not be intermittent fasting uh, you can follow the 12 hour rule but uh, you should not go extreme fasting at all, not over 12 or 13 hours. Uh, anyone undergoing surgery is not a good contender for intermittent fasting, which is over 12 hours, unless obviously medically specified for following anything. Anyone undergoing chemo, radiation, cancer uh, treatment should not be intermittent fasting or doing extreme fasts. And if you have any kind of chronic health conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular issues or anything, or blood pressure, uh, then you are a good contender. As I explained, you can really get a lot of benefit, but you need to get involved, your medical practitioner. You need to go ask them that I'm planning to fast. What is it I should be observing? What are the medication changes? And you should always do it under guided supervision, especially if you have low blood pressure, uh, low blood sugar issues. If you have severe adrenal fatigue or you've been under an extreme stressful state, because of whatever is happening in your life and you're really, really stressed, especially women, uh, you can do the 12 hour, which is again a thumb rule, but anything above that, you really, really need to work with a practitioner to understand how to switch that state because your hormonal hormones are haywire. Uh, there's a lot of cortisol production, which happens when you have adrenal fatigue, when you're under extreme stress, and you need to really know how to fast to get the benefits of fasting and not uh, push your body into extreme stressful situations where you can't even function properly. And if you have any kind of eating disorders, uh, bulimia or a relationship to food is messed up, again, intermittent fasting can be done, but you really need to work with uh, somebody who specializes in uh, eating disorder management uh, with a coach who can guide you through it and then do intermittent fasting along with that because otherwise it can really mess up uh, what you're eating and instead of getting the benefits you can get more uh, harmful side effects of uh, because of the eating disorders so um, that finishes the presentation and in conclusion again repeating and emphasizing that intermittent fasting typically fasting I mean again as I said intermittent fasting is a word which has been coined today because of the scientific research which we have but uh, it is actually a more I would say the most powerful tool that you have, which costs nothing. And it is available to you to assist your body's own healing ability, the intelligence, which is inherent and inbuilt in you, in each one of us. But the benefit will depend on where you are on a spectrum of health and how, uh, so how fast it'll uh, kind of benefit you will depend on a lot of factors. And again, the biggest factor one is where you are on a spectrum of health. 
Um, as I said, 12 hours of fa fasting and 12 hours of eating can be a thumb rule, can be a part of your lifestyle. No need. Uh, this is not really, I would not consider it uh, really intermittent fasting as in specialized time-restricted eating. That's uh, part of your life. And how disciplined and motivated you are is, again, a very important reason. Are you ready to prioritize yourself and prioritize your own health as compared to just doing it for the sake of doing it and not going through. So it'll all depend on how motivated you are as well for you to get the benefit. And I always say that there will be days when you fall off the wagon, which is okay. It's not, it should not be considered a failure. It should just be considered a le learning uh, opportunity that, okay, this didn't work. There were reasons, but as far as you kind of come back on track, you're still continuing. You're not giving it up. Um. So I will stop sharing. I just, I just want to kind of uh, just end this presentation. I'll open it up for questions and I'll stop recording before that. But I just want this to go on the recording that uh, the upcoming sessions, the next month is going to be on gut health. And in March, I'll be talking about spring cleaning and detox because actually that's the official nature's season for cleansing or detoxification. Or if you plan to do a mild uh, spring cleanse based on Ayurveda. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that in March. So I will uh, stop recording and stop sharing as well and open it up for any questions.